long journey into the heart of Ireland's oldest city. All around me is some of the finest agricultural land in the country and the produce, trade and commerce of land and sea have made this port an international trading centre for a thousand years. Where land meets sea, geographers like me expect to find great ports. It's that the great port of Waterford is 27 kilometres inland from the sea and this city's maritime tradition makes it one of the great adventures in building Ireland. In this series, our team, an engineer, an architect and a geographer, is exploring some of the finest examples of Ireland's building and engineering heritage. And this time we tell the story of Waterford and its quay. The port of Waterford's quay wall is a mile long and was known as the noblest quay of Europe in its heyday. But the question is, why build such an impressive port so far from the sea? And what made the city of Waterford build such a magnificent quay? First settled by the Vikings, Waterford is the oldest city in Ireland. By the early 18th century, Waterford was a hub of prosperity and migration. Architect Orla Murphy is retracing that history. The story of this city can be read through its buildings and streetscapes. Every era, every phase of economic activity can be seen in the character of the architecture. It's absolutely such a hidden secret. I want to find out how local agricultural produce fueled the maritime trade. Oh, you start banging it. And engineer Tim Joyce is looking into the industries that connect this city to the sea. I want to find out more about the shipyards and the technology they used because in the mid-1900s, Waterford was a world leader in building and operating iron steamships. This city sits near the mouth of a powerful river system, which has carved a deep open channel to the sea. The key wall is 27 kilometres inland. On the face of it, it seems like a very odd place to establish a trading port. In fact, it's the perfect place because it's a safe haven for seagoing ships. One aspect of the city's location that's a bit unusual is that all the development is on the southern side of the river. Medieval Waterford was a large walled town, and even then it was a trading centre of international importance. Hello Susan, you're very welcome. Welcome Thank to the so Museum of Treasures, the Medieval Museum. Donegal Callaghan is the curator of Waterford's Museum of Treasures, and he showed me how the city developed through the centuries. This leads straight up to the next one, which is 1440. Oh, the furnishing... Donoghue took me into the bustling world of 17th century Waterford. Right, Susan, we're here in the Bishop's Palace, and um, behind us, I suppose, we have a view of the city of Waterford 1736. But what I really want to show you is this plan of the city of Waterford wow. 1764. Oh, wow. I suppose the interesting thing we can see from this map is the fact that the city walls are still here mm -hmm. over a lot of the area. You can see them all along here on the very heavy black line. Yes, the whole way through the ramparts, yeah. Yeah, and um, as this, you can see that, for example, missing walls along here, along the quay. What happened gone. to them? Well, actually, they were demolished in the early 18th century and the city council at the time decided to open up the city okay. so that um, the walls along the quay were demolished and the stone from those walls was then used as the foundation for the quay, this new quay, which stretched almost in a, in a straight line up along the river. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the foundation then really of Waterford's prosperity in the 18th century, you know, trade, commerce, importing and exporting. So the demolishing of this opened up the whole city? It opened up the entire the city really to the world as a centre of trade and commerce and industry. Waterford's magnificent quay stretched 40 feet out from the sloping contour of the city. Ships bulged with basics like timber, salt and tea, as well as exotic spices and precious goods. But the location, near the confluence of the Three Sisters, rivers Nor, Shore and Barrow, meant the volume of water caused a major problem, silt. Ships were forced to berth alongside floating hulks, away from the shallow, silted up quay wall. The building of one of the largest quays in Europe, which heralded a golden age of maritime activity for Waterford. And the ships that came in here didn't just bring cargo, they brought people. Much of the influence of those arrivals can be seen in the buildings. 
and Orla is investigating that history. During the Reformation, religious persecution in England and Europe brought an influx of Quakers and Protestant French Huguenot immigrants to Waterford. They brought business and trade skills and their own architectural styles. I went to meet Maura Henry, Head of Department of Architecture at Waterford Institute of Technology, to look at a Quaker-designed building. This building represents the Quaker ethos in architecture at the time in Waterford, which was uh, extremely important. And this is a fine example of their simple, pure approach to architectural style. It's very stripped back, isn't it? Very stripped back. No ornament, the bare minimum, beautiful volumes, very simple spaces. All that reflects the Quaker ethos. Yeah. It's about, I suppose, letting the space express its simplicity. The 18th century was a time of great prosperity in Waterford City. Georgian terraces, public buildings and dramatic merchant houses were being built, influenced and designed by one Waterford architect. What's the significance of John Roberts' work in the city? John Roberts was the most important Georgian architect in Waterford um, in the 1700s. He was born in Waterford. He is associated with most of the uh, important public buildings, civic buildings of the time, including the two cathedrals, which was a huge accomplishment given that we're talking about the 1700s and he was responsible for designing both Christ Church Cathedral and uh, the Cathedral of the Holy Trinity on Barn Strand Street. So he must be able to navigate politics, religion, and kind of cross those boundaries and be a good communicator. Apart from I imagine else. so. Yeah. And my own feeling on the matter is he had 22 children, I believe, so he's probably had to deal with every sort of dispute possible. But he designed City Infirmary. He designed what is now the Chamber of Commerce on O'Connell Street. So he is one of the most important native-born Georgian architects in Ireland. I'm on my way to explore an architectural gem in a late 18th century townhouse right in the heart of Waterford City. One feature of this townhouse is a masterpiece of design and craftsmanship with one simple function. People walk up and down it every day. Georgian architects knew how to make an entrance and their finest architectural statements were reserved for their interiors. This cantilevered spiral staircase is unique in Ireland and the man who restored it knows every step, Master Carpenter Andy Kelly. Andy, hello. Hello. Pleased to meet you. Hey. Hello, how are you? So what you get when you ascend this staircase is a sense of theatricality and drama that the spiral lit from the roof brings to the, the procession of walking up the stairs and coming to the first yes, floor. It is, yes, and that's, that's, architects always look for that, to get a natural light to come into a staircase area because it's a difficult area to light normally. Whereas the dome overhead casts light over the whole area. You've been making stairs for 40 years. What is it that makes these stairs so special? Well, it's unique in the sense that a timber can't leave a staircase. They normally were stone. Each individual step in this individually shaped. So it was not a case of making one and then re repeating it. I don't know of any other staircase like this in the country. Now tell me, Andy, how you might make a cantilever timber stairs like this? Well, I, I've done a half-scale model just here. And this is similar to the style and design and how this one was built. This is represent the plaster wall, and each slot here is where the step will actually slot into. You start off with the end step, which the, the whole integrity of the stairs is that that, that is securely fixed. The first ground. step. First step, absolutely securely fixed. An important detail in the steps is this rebate here, where the following step slots into position and prevents them from moving forward. I'm surprised at the amount of uh, support that the wall gives. It's actually less than I would have expected for a cantilever. Provided the end step is securely fixed and can move, well then the rest of them can't move. So and the proof of that is that this circus is two, nearly 240 years old. Well, Orla, that's the cantilever circus now. Do you want to have a go <laughs> and give it a go? I'll give it a go. So this is a half-scale model. Absolutely. And if I gingerly walk up these half-sized treads, they should be able to support my weight. <laughs> The mile-long key wall, the noblest key in Europe, was the cornerstone of all economic activity and opportunity in Waterford. 
Indentured servants, or those in debt, often took seasonal work on fishing boats, a business that took off with the discovery of a massive natural resource. Fishing was the first boom industry of Waterford, starting in the 1600s. But the fish came from the other side of the world, from the rich cod banks off Newfoundland. It meant that salted Atlantic cod was available here in the Waterford markets on a daily basis. The Irish translation of Newfoundland is Talvanesk, the fishing grounds. The cod was so bountiful and the specimens so large that the city prospered. But it would be wrong to think that the bounty of the sea made the port of Waterford wealthy. It was actually the produce of the land that really fueled the success of the port. On Waterford's quayside, merchants learned the business of ships chandling, supplying local food produce to the maritime trade. Ships from Europe and England stocked up on supplies before long transatlantic voyages. Food processing industries flourished in Waterford and local business Denny's became a global bacon brand. The best example of the success of Waterford Chandlers was in the production of the ship's biscuit. One Waterford baker, George Jacob, developed its most famous example, the cream cracker. Hi, Michael, is it? To learn more about how the ship's biscuit evolved, I met local chef, Michael Quinn, to get a flavour for a sailor's ration. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and absolute history fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. The port was thriving, there was hundreds of ships coming in and out of here, mm -hmm. lots of sailors to be fed at sea. So I'll just show you what went into the original ship's biscuit. It just had normal kind of um, brown flour. Mm -hmm. There was salt added and then there was water. Okay. And then it was rolled out and it was baked uh, in a slow, kind of a slowish oven for a long time because they needed to get it crisp. Okay. Uh, and hard because it needed to last, obviously last at sea. Then the sailors would dunk them okay. in, in gravy or their, 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 yes, their brawn or whatever they have. They're very, very tough, aren't they? The, the older mm. they, they are, the harder they get. And the Jacob Brothers, what was the difference then between these and the cream crackers? The cream cracker came later. One of the younger members of the Jacobs family went to America mm -hmm. and they found a kind of a, a, a cracker, a, a light cracker. Okay. Uh, they came back, they did a bit of research, they, they set this up um, and then obviously they went on to create the, the famous cream cracker. So what have you done in store for? Servicing ships on the quayside wasn't enough for some of the ambitious business families in Waterford who decided to build and operate the ships themselves. Tim is discovering the scale and international success of the local shipbuilders. The shipyards of Waterford employed a thousand workers at their peak in the mid-1800s, and for a time, it was the most important shipbuilding site in the country. It's a story of ingenuity and world-class innovation, and a real high point of Ireland's industrial heritage. In 1835, there were 115 sailing ships registered in Waterford. A local family, the Whites, established the country's first purpose-built dockyards for the repair of wooden ships. Other Waterford names, like Pimrose and the innovative Malcolmsons, became bywords for excellence and power in the shipping world. Using Irish oak for its strength and hardness, Whites developed a worldwide reputation for quality wooden sailing ships. The 92-foot schooner, the Hellas, was the pinnacle of all wooden sailing clippers. It was the first Irish ship to race directly across the East Indian trade routes to China. Bringing back teas for the Bewley business in Dublin finally broke London's monopoly on the supply of tea. 
Waterford's shipbuilding begins to expand as the Industrial Revolution takes off. Before long, the magnificent timber sail ships are under threat from mighty iron steamships. But there was no way that builders like the Malcolmsons were going to get left behind. I'm told the Malcolmsons Neptune shipyard was based here, where John's River meets the shore. Des Griffin of the Waterford Civic Trust is going to help me understand the scale of iron shipbuilding in the city and the industrial significance of the Malcolmsons. Where exactly are we now? We're in Canada Street, Tim, in Waterford City, and we're looking at the site, looking just across at the site of the Neptune shipyards. But it was here that the Malcolmsons built some of the biggest iron ships during the mid-19th century. Who were the Malcolmsons? What were they to Waterford City? Well, I suppose the Malcolmson sort of were the forerunners of multinational companies, the people with a big, almost a global reach from a small city like Waterford. They had 90 steamships in the 1860s, 90 steamships registered in Waterford Port, 90 ships. They were described as the biggest steamship owners in the kingdom at the time. So as we look up the street here at Lake Cannon Street, we're looking at the whole length of the street being the dockyard, the shipyard, culminating in the 1860s, the Indiana, 110 yards long, a, a beam of 33 feet, a draft of 26 feet, the length of that, the stern towering over the, the river, the, and the bow towering over, over the other end of Canada Street. Launching a ship that big into this river? Yes. Was that easy? Well, the river is, I'd say, relatively narrow here, but constrained by a 15-minute window each side of the full tide to launch a ship stern first of that length 325 feet stern first into the water must have been a really technical enterprise called for great expertise. It must have been, if I can use the expression, a titanic noise. The Neptune shipyard pioneered the use of watertight compartments in iron ships and adopted propellers in an age when paddle propulsion was the norm. Assembling an iron hull involved teams of men bending sheet metal together using rivets. It's very hot. Yeah. There we are. Each ship required hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of rivets, to be forged and hammered into place. I asked Finian Christie, a master blacksmith, how it all came together. What were the different jobs those men had? Well, the young apprentice, he would have worked out of the fire yeah. and he would have been getting the rivets ready for the actual blacksmith, the master blacksmith. The blacksmith would send it through the hole. In the meantime, then there'd be two people on the inside which would have the likes of that. And it's rounded like that that's to rounded, take the like, head? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. like a mushroom head. Yeah. And that's how they would finish that off, to get yeah. nice and smooth. And the noise, banging noise, oh, there were stone deaf people, a lot of them going home. The next stage in this is I'm doing a bit of plate work here. Them days there was no welders, so everything had to be riveted together. That's the a solid joint. Okay, Tim. Now that I've done all my work, now you're going to have a little go. So well, here you are. I hope I'll cover There's myself in glory Two here. Two and a half pound hammer. Okay. So if you come around here, I'll hold it for you. Just tap it first. Okay. Go on, good and hard. Yeah. That's a blacksmith in the making. Oh, very good. Very good, then. I'll tell you, I'm relieved. Yeah, I didn't well, think it would turn out this good. Great. That's actually a great job. Excellent, thank you. I'll give you, i say, seven out of ten. Well, you're the, the master. Thing. Well done. Now I understand why you got these <laughs> and why I don't have them. Yeah, well. This is what's left of the gates of the Neptune Yard. 40 ships were built here between 1846 and 82. The materials used, the design and engineering and craftsmanship were world class. But then the tide began to turn against the shipbuilders of Waterford. By the end of the 1860s, Belfast overtook Waterford as the leading location for iron shipbuilding in Ireland. Shortly after 1870, the Malcolmson's business empire collapsed in a perfect storm of their London bankers going bust and poor business management within the family. To meet the liabilities, their vast fleet of ships was sold. The sun had set on a golden age of shipbuilding in Waterford. 
Waterford earned its reputation as the noblest Georgian quay in Europe, with all the advantages of an 18th century port city. Waterford's trump card in geographical terms was that the port was right in the heart of the city. From earliest times, it really helped business to have everything centralised, but the advantage backfired with the coming of motorised transport. The loading and unloading of heavy cargo using big cranes in the city centre became chaotic. But the ships weren't the problem. The increase in the numbers of trucks and vans caused traffic problems and led to demands for more warehousing. After the Second World War, there was a revolution in the transportation of goods. It was a new technology that would make international trade faster and cheaper and change the way the ports operated. It was containerization. In 1955, standardised containers created a seamless, unified transportation system for cargo. The role of the docker changed immediately. Containerization put 85% of them out of work. Waterford-based Bell Lines became the first shipping company in the world to integrate from ship to shore via cranes, trains and trucks. Bellevue, four kilometres downstream from the city port, is now Waterford's dedicated terminal and it's where I met Captain Joe Kenny, an early pioneer of containerised shipping. So Joe, what was your involvement in all of this? Um, I worked with Bell, who were the um, people who, if you like, brought containerisation into Ireland, and Waterford was a key port. Actually, Waterford was the only port in Ireland. These gantry cranes here are amazing. What role do they play? With gantry cranes, you could automate the system you no longer needed complete gangs of men to physically load and unload ship. The port can operate with crane driver, and then you back that up with an integrated computer operation so you know what's on the ship, what's on the trucks coming in. You can plan that type of operation, which is what the world needs today. OK. Now, how are you fixed now? I am actually fine. I just want to look down. <laughs> How high is it? 39 metres today. 39 metres? Yeah. Fantastic. It's like being on top of the spire in Dublin. Yeah, yeah. So, Michael, how many containers can you move per hour? I can move 40 discharging a ship. We had 100,000 boxes a year back in 07. And has it dropped since then? It have. We're looking to do 15. Really? Yeah. Okay. You can see the amount of water going through here. It's just incredible. But you can imagine the Vikings coming up that river over there for the first time. Okay, I'm getting a bit scared now. <laughs> Are you? Yeah. I like the river, but not that much. <laughs> Waterford's 1,000-year history is visible in its architecture. The city's unique urban fabric expanded magnificently in the 18th and 19th centuries, which Maura Henry of the Waterford Institute of Technology explains. This is a city now that is proud, that is developing, and that is celebrating the expansion. This is where they decided, the merchant class, to build their buildings of note, their theatre for amusement, their fine terraces on the other side, lots of merchant houses. Behind me you have the Bishop's Palace, which was built on um, a medieval structure, as was Christchurch Cathedral behind it, because this area really knits together several layers of construction. But this moment, when it was being built, this is a moment of positivity and expansion. Waterford City grew up around its river. Time and tide may have changed the Great Port and its magnificent quay, but the city's reputation for quality and excellence dies hard. Waterford's historic core has adapted to new realities in tourism, food and crafts. The fortunes of a port ebb and flow with the imports and exports that come across its quays. This city's most important trade and exchange was not just in commodities. The exchange of ideas, people and partnerships left a lasting impression on the city and the entire region. The legacy is seen in the geography, the buildings and the people of Waterford City.